the most significant question in this text is the question, why are you so afraid? When we think about walking with Jesus and we think about those great conversations that he had, this was a prominent theme. Why are we so afraid? It's a good question, isn't it? Have you ever wondered about situations in life that you experienced and after you've gone through them you said, well, that wasn't that bad. I made it through. Why was I so afraid? The Christian life is like that. There are a lot of experiences in the Christian life that may seem, before we engage them, somewhat fearful. It seems like we come into this world primed to be afraid, don't we? As soon as we are born, someone that we don't even know slaps us on the bottom, and we cry, and we cry out for being afraid. A Calvinist was asked on one occasion, how do you know that babies are born sinful, born in sin? And he answered, well, it makes sense. As soon as you're born, you're getting spanked for something. But that cry of fear seems is what we do best, especially during those first few years of life. But even though they might not always, or the fear might not always manifest itself in tears, that fear continues throughout life. And there's plenty to fear. And we need to understand, especially in this text, you know, the, the disciples, the apostles, always seem to be afraid of something. Always. And we need to understand when the Lord says, fear not, what he means. There's plenty to fear, isn't there? In some places in the world, people fear hunger. You and I don't even begin to imagine what that's like. But they fear hunger for their next meal. Sometimes we fear falling. Sometimes we're fearful of uh, animals. Sometimes we're fearful of unemployment. Speaking about the tempest yesterday, sometimes we fear tornadoes. Sometimes we fear accidents. Sometimes we fear pandemics. Sometimes we fear riots. Sometimes we fear being unloved. Sometimes we fear death. There are lots of things, especially from the human side, from the human perspective. There is a lot of fear. But you know, when we look at the Word of God and we look even at science, fearful being, having a healthy amount of fear is good for us. It's very good for us. Life contains dangers. You know, it's, it's very good for a little child to develop the fear of busy streets. And the earlier the better. That's a good thing. You know, teenagers need to develop a healthy fear of getting behind the wheel of a car for the first time. There needs to be that inner fear. You know, grown-up men and women, husbands and wives... They need to develop a healthy fear for infidelity and what that could bring and the influence that that has. Healthy fear. We all need to develop a fear against sin and where it can lead. And where sin, not walking in the light, can lead to eternal destruction. We need to have a healthy fear fear of that. Fear God and keep his commandments. There's a definition to fear that is secondary to trepidation and that is respect. Some fear is necessary and it's healthy. You know our brains use fear to protect us. Do you know that the Lord created us that way? At the lowest level of our brains, God created an alarm system. And that is a significant thing. God gave us the neurological equipment to think at a much higher level than animals. 
at the very top level of the human brain are parts that think, hey, I have a choice to be afraid. Animals don't have that. But it's possible for that thinking to occur, to overcome fear. We have to emphasize the word possible. It's not a given. You've got to train your mind in certain areas not to be afraid. Animals don't have that higher level in their brains. In fact, most of their behavior is predicated upon the reaction, the automatic reaction of being afraid. The Christians certainly should not be that way. You know, snakes don't have this ability. I recall in my childhood one of the very first times I was afraid. I mean, really afraid. Dad and I were out in the woods. It was down on Eight Mile Ridge. I don't know if you remember this or not. You remember this. I don't know. I, I, I wasn't walking long. <laughs> I don't know how old I was. I can't recall. But we were walking along, and uh, Dad had a shotgun, and there was a copperhead right in front of my, right in, well, off to the right, but could very easily strike. And I didn't see it. And I was uh, walking along, and Dad stuck his hand out and kind of pushed me, and I saw it then. And man, I took off. Can't, I, I don't remember being afraid before then, but I remember that time. And then I, as I was running away, I heard the shotgun, and I knew the fate of the snake. Now, Dad, kind of being who he is, wanted to take that trophy back to the ladies. And he had me carry it. And I mean, the snake was probably as tall as I was. And uh, that was probably good for me. I, I overcame that fear of snake. But that time, I was afraid and I just reacted. Now, if I would have gotten close to that snake or perhaps even stepped on that snake, that snake would have been probably as afraid as I was. But you know what he would have done? He wouldn't have thought, well, should I be afraid of this? I've experienced this before. You know, they don't have that upper level thinking like we do. He would have struck back, and I bet his reaction would have been faster than my reaction of getting out of there. Can you imagine if God created us without that ability to overcome our fear? Can you imagine, given what the world is now, can you imagine what it would be like to not have that upper order of thinking in our brains? To not have that brain function. You know, forms of dementia, which Alzheimer's is a form, affect that part of the brain that impairs the logical reasoning and to be able to turn off fear. That's why those that experience that, they're fearful of so many things. That disease affects that part of the brain. Post-traumatic stress syndrome. We now know how very real that is when people come back from war and they have been in such fearful situations that that part of their brain has been affected and they're fearful of other things. Jesus asked the question here in the middle of the storm, what are you fearing? He knew they didn't have dementia. He knew that as the creator, he created them with the ability to overcome fear. When you're coming to someone who doesn't know the gospel and you are deciding whether or not to tell them anything, why are you afraid? When you go through the storms of life, why are you afraid? Jesus is asking us as we consider this conversation in our series, Walking with Jesus. Why are you afraid? Sometimes when that part of the brain is affected, whether it's post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome, whether it's Alzheimer's, a certain sight, a certain smell, a certain sound, a certain touch 
will affect all of that. And the soldier that comes back and he sees something that triggers in his mind what happened in Vietnam or in other foreign wars. Affects that part. And that's why Jesus is asking, why are you fearing? Is there some neurological underdevelopment or effect that makes you still be afraid? You have the word of God. You have me in your life. What are you afraid of? Fear is to some degree a part of the human condition. Fear affects us all. We struggle in this life, though, to utilize our fear properly, biblically. Christians cannot be controlled by fear. And that's why you have in the lists of sins, many times fear is number one. That's why the Lord in his ministry so often deals with fear. You know, most every day, especially outside of uh, pandemic parameters, I speak to somebody who is afraid of something. And I'm sure you do as well. Who is afraid? Who is overly worried? Jesus addressed this, did he not, even in the Sermon on the Mount? Do you remember? He said, take no thought for your life. What will you eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on? Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Have you had to ever worry about where your next meal is coming from? Do you ever have to worry about not having a choice when you walk into your closet and what clothes to put on? We almost do that subconsciously, don't we? We don't have to worry about those things. Well, who do you think provided that? So what are you worried about? We've got to get to the level in our brains, in our minds, in our spirits, to we're not afraid of anything that this life can, can give us. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your Heavenly Father takes care of them. How much greater are you than they? We know that part of Scripture well, don't we? But yet, the question still comes to the apostles and to us, what are we afraid of? Well, how many fear knots are in the Bible? Have you ever counted them or Googled that question? How many fear knots are there? It's been said by Lloyd Ogilvy in his book, Facing the Future Without Fear, that there are 366 fear knots in the Bible, one for each day of the year, including leap years. Well, I'm sure most of you have heard that uh, idea, and I want to tell you it's not even close to being true. It's a nice little thought, but it doesn't happen. In the King James Version of the Bible, fear not or be not afraid occurs 103 times. The subject of fear occurs 500 times or more. So the 366 is, is way off. Fear is spoken of, in addition to the fear knots, as we mentioned earlier, fear God, which really means revere him or respect him, sometimes is and sometimes isn't included in that number. Fear within us is projected by our perceived reality, either rightly or wrongly. And the Lord, what is reality? If you were to give a one-word answer, or a one-word answer to the question, what is reality, what would that word be? If something is real, what is it? And yes, we can hear you even inside the mask, so go ahead, you can, you can answer that question. What, what, what is another word for reality? Yes, that which is true, truth, Right? If it's real, it's true. If it's true, it's real. So, who did Jesus say he was? I am the way, the what? The truth. The truth. So, if our perception of reality is the Lord's truth, and that's really the only truth there is, and he knows it, 
and he knows the future, you know, that's, t- that's, too great, uh, com- that's, that's a great combination there. Knowing the truth and knowing the future. That's who we serve. So even in the midst of the storm, what are you afraid of? Are you fearful for your life? Well, the Lord took care of that, didn't he? He's got a better life for you. Are you fearful of death? Are you fearful of what people think of you? Are, you know, the Lord handles all of those situations, doesn't he? We can perceive reality. We can understand reality in a right way. It's possible. But you know, it's not possible for Jesus to perceive reality in a wrong way. He cannot do that. Fear not, he says. Why? Because I have overcome the world, the things about which we worry. And if our goal, if our focus is on heaven, then we worry less about the things of this life. You know why we worry? The degree we worry is the degree that we are too concerned with this life. You know, I don't know how many times, you know, you know there, are, there are certain things that we are commanded not to do that for some reason people seem to want to emphasize that they do. Boy, I tell you, you know, you should have seen me in that traffic jam. I gave him a piece of my mind. Oh, I just worry all the time. You know, I just, uh, I, 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 I'm just a worry wart. That's just who I am. The gospel accounts tell us the apostles of Jesus were afraid an awful lot. They were afraid at the transfiguration. They were afraid when Jesus walked on the water. They were afraid when he healed the sick. They were afraid when he raised the dead. He, they were really afraid when he would challenge the religious leaders. They were afraid in the garden. Even to the point where they wanted to forget what was going on around them and they slept and they ignored it. They were afraid when they came to the tomb and it was empty. Even though the Lord told them that he was going to to rise again in three days after his death. And now here on the storms on Galilee, what is their condition? They are afraid again. Why is this in the Bible? Why is this emphasized in the Bible? When you're walking with Jesus, why is he continually telling us, don't be afraid, guys. I've got this. Trust me. All disciples of Jesus will confront fear. Fear can be a healthy thing, as we've noted. But boy, do we need to control it in that part of our brain that God has given us. To control it. Isn't that what Christianity is anyway? What's a sum total of Christianity? Mind control. Think right so we'll do right. So we'll love God. As a man thinks in his heart so is he. That's the brain. Well use that brain to overcome fear. That's what the lesson is. When we see these storms on Galilee. And we see the apostles in the midst of the storm. Notice the disciples, they got into the storm. Notice they got into the storm. How'd they get into it? By following Jesus. (laughs) Well, that seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Don't fear, but if you follow me, you're going to be in fearful situations. It's not paradoxical to the spiritual mind. It's not paradoxical to the mind that says... Listen, Jesus is my Lord. He was in a lot of fearful situations, but he overcame the world. He overcame fear. How was he able to go to the cross? Do you think he called upon his divinity to get him through that? Why did he experience fear, but he went anyway? Why does a good soldier experience fear, but he goes anyway? Why does a good Christian experience fear and he goes anyway? Why are you fearful? Why are you fearful? Not, Jesus is not asking the apostles, why do you have these feelings of fear? Jesus is asking the apostles, why do these feelings of fear distort your view of truth and of me? Master!
What do you think of everything the apostle said in that text hurt the heart of Jesus the most? Don't you care? It's not, Master, we're perishing. I don't think that's what rose or what raised the ire of Jesus. Because when you look at the Greek construction of this and he rebuked the sea, that idea of rebuking there gives the idea that Jesus was perturbed that such trivial matters would necessitate his attention. He rebuked the sea. Imagine. And even his enemies would say, what are we going to do with this guy? Even the winds and the waves obey his voice. What are you worried about then? What am I worried about? Jesus looked at this tempest, at this storm as trivial. And think about it, in light of eternity, how trivial was it? The Lord has given us what we need to know about him, about life, in order to overcome fear. Have you? Have I done it yet? Where is our focus? Jesus is not afraid. Even Mark records by inspiration that Jesus had a pillow. Oh my goodness, he had a pillow. Isn't it interesting? That the Bible says that Jesus typically, during his typical life, didn't even have a pillow upon which to lay his head. But in the storm, Jesus has a pillow. And I bet it was a lot better than my pillow from Mike Lindell. But he slept. He slept during the storm. Can you go to sweet sleep during the storm? If you're a faithful Christian walking in the light and that blood isn't like Lincoln prayed. Did you see how, how Lincoln phrased that and then he quickly changed it? Our sins are forgiven. I loved it. They are continually forgiven as we walk in that light even in our imperfections, what are you worried about? Just don't live that kind of life. And you have nothing to worry about. The Lord has his pillow, and he's calm. And he's trying to give you a calm light if you'll let that part of your brain overcome fear. Well... Then in, in very visceral terms, Jesus rebuked that wind, and he's awakened. Did you ever awaken somebody when they didn't want to be awakened? It's not always pleasant, is it? I, I think when Jesus rebuked the wind here, he's probably almost as upset as he was when he overturned the money changers in the temple. That's this idea of rebuking here. They're just afraid. But in verse 41, they're not just afraid. They're exceedingly afraid. After all they've seen, Jesus asked, how have you no faith? Look where fear leads as we conclude. Look where fear leads. Yeah. It must have been very painful to Jesus to hear, don't you care? Don't you care, Lord, if we drown? Listen, I read that text and I thought, how would I have responded to that if I were in the Lord's shoes? Which is, believe me, very incidental compared to what the Lord did say. But I would have responded something like this. Don't you know that I came to die for you to keep you from drowning spiritually and you're worried about drowning physically and I'm here in your presence? That's how I would have responded. What do you mean, don't I care? Don't you care? And that's the question we ask in our song, right? Carest thou not that we perish? How can you lie asleep? That's coming from, you know, a negative perspective if we ask the Lord that. Haven't we studied his word and have had and have walked closely with Jesus enough to know that he cares? And he cares greatly? And he wants to hear from us? They didn't just doubt his ability to save. They doubted his ability to care. Oh, my. 
what level of faith did they have? Even after being with him for years and seeing the miracles, fear blinded them to not only perceive danger accurately, you know, and that's going to be our problem. If we are fearful people, we're not perceiving that danger accurately, but not only that, it robs us of our ability to see Jesus accurately and what that relationship is all about. That is a shot to our Lord that we won't trust him as we should. Because, you know, we sing it all the time. The power and the blood and Jesus is Lord and master of all and he is in control and we love him. Oh, we sing the songs about loving him, but we don't trust him. How can the two be congruent? It blinded them. Their perishing, their lack of faith blinded them to the knowledge and the work of Jesus. You know why the one talent man was lost? Not just because he had one talent. It's because he was afraid. And that fear kept him from seeing his master as he should. Does our fear keep us from seeing Jesus as we should? And what he's doing in our lives? Listen, fear happens when you follow Jesus. You get those feelings. And that's not the sin. The sin is when we let those feelings keep us from doing what is right. And having our faith in the Savior. Carest thou not that we perish? Let that never, let us never ask that in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. We know the answer to that. Are we going to respond with that part of the brain that God has given us to love him and to trust him? Perhaps there's someone here today that is fearing something in their life to the degree that is impairing them or impeding them in their walk with Christ as we're discussing this year and with this conversation none of us should leave this building in a type of fear that we give mental space to it very long because we know that Jesus is here in the midst of any storm and he will handle it if we can help you not be afraid we want to do that and you can let that be known by responding right now to the invitation song as we stand and sing it.